But let's get you across more on what he's been watching and more of today's market moves. Chris Conway, Chief Market and Trading Strategist at the Australian Stock Report, joins us. Look, Chris, great to have you with us today. I mentioned that the ASX seems to be holding up pretty well, uh, given the lacklustre lead that we had, in particular from those US tech stocks overnight. I'm also just looking at some of those moves around the Asian region. A lot of it seems to be weaker. But as I say, we're managing you know, to hold up relatively well. What are you making of today's uh, trading performance? Good afternoon, Leanne. You'll forgive me for saying so. It doesn't make for great TV, but I think today is a little bit of a nothing session. Um, obviously, as you say, we had those weak leads from Wall Street based on tech weakness, and we do have some of our tech stocks lower today, but let's face it, we don't have a very big tech sector here in Australia to speak of. Mm. And the market is just sort of holding steady, and I think, uh, you know, forgive me for, again, repeating myself. I said this last week, but everyone is just keeping their powder dry, waiting for reporting season to kick off in earnest. I know Credit Corp and a few others have dropped uh, numbers and at least uh, production report updates today. But no offence to those companies, nothing really there to move the needle. So again, we are in sort of uh, hurry up and wait mode at the moment. Um, hopefully, and it'll bring some fireworks next week when you mm. know, a big swathe of results drops. Look, Chris, I know that we have spoken to you about, obviously, the technical levels that we're watching on the market, and it still seems like uh, we're at the top end of, of the recent range and still waiting for this catalyst to break us out. And it seems to be higher at the moment, doesn't it, if you look at that trend? I know that we're all looking at that next catalyst perhaps being reporting season. Do you think we will get that breakout and perhaps to the upside? I certainly hope so. Look, I think the, um, I think the expectations for earnings season are you know slightly aggressive i wouldn't say overly aggressive so they're not beyond expectations i think everyone's looking for about seven percent eps growth over the entire market which is probably achievable um and yeah just pivoting back to the technicals as you talk about we are in an ascending triangle pattern at, at the moment where the, the neckline is at 6300 it's a very obvious level and we've had these uh shallower and shallower troughs so it looks like we are building up some momentum and if reporting season wasn't starting today, I would actually be positioning myself for a further breakout. But you throw into reporting season there, uh, you know, and some of the, uh, you know, well, as I said, expectations and the potential for hits and misses, um, mm. and it adds an, ad an added layer of risk. So, yeah, it does look as though we will break out, but reporting season needs to be good and meets, needs to meet those, I, was, I would categorise them as slightly more aggressive expectations for us to, uh, to, to break clear of that 6,300 level. Mm. Uh, you mentioned there the hits and misses and obviously we will uh, watch and wait uh, with beta breath over the next few weeks just to see how it all pans out. But if we look at the expectations heading into reporting season, we're really in the first week, although it's a very, very quiet week as we mentioned, just trickling through this week and it will start to ramp up next week and certainly the week after. I mean, is a lot of that outperformance expected to come from the energy and materials plays? Maybe, maybe you can sort of just give us a, a sector by sector rundown of what exactly you are expecting. Yes, yeah, so I, I think the bulk majority of the air performance will come from materials and energy. And again, forgive me for repeating myself, but uh, it's because underlying commodities have performed exceptionally well. Mm. Uh, oil prices, obviously, copper, um, iron ore, not so much. Um, but yeah, obviously, underlying commodities have done really well. So that would feed through to the results that we're going to see from materials and energy plays. And outside of that, you know, there's not too much to get excited about. One. Uh, sector I think that is really worth watching because valuations have run hard is is the healthcare space. Um, you know, every time around this time of year, uh, we all question whether you know the likes of CSL and Cochlear should be trading around $200 on the multiples that they're trading. And ultimately, most of the time in the past, they have met those expectations, and it hasn't been a surprise to see them up, you know, five or ten percent on the day that they drop numbers. So. Just one to watch there. Um, the, the financial sector, I don't think, will do particularly well. And even some of the, the smaller segments of the market that aren't sectors, but, you know, you look at something like Infant Formula, the names A2, Milk and Bellamy's, I think people are much more circumspect this time around. You know, having seen in the past that these valuations were quite high, they slightly miss and then the stock is down 10, 20, 30%. So I think everyone is reluctant to be holding those names into the numbers drop. I think this time around people are more likely to wait to see how the numbers drop, are prepared to forego those big moves on the day and then might look to catch a rally to the upside or downside um, post the actual numbers drop themselves. Mm. And so how exactly are you positioning? Are there any stocks in particular that you've been taking some risk off the table before we head into reporting season? Obviously some of those I'm sure you are watching with keen interest as well just to see what sort of numbers they do report. Um, how are you sort of positioning yourselves portfolio-wise? 
Yeah, so look, I, again, Leanne, I'm a trader. I think uh, most mm. of the people that, that watch me know that by now. So I have actually re reduced risk. Um, more about where the, the market is and the, as I was talking about before, the expectations heading into reporting season and, and that if we do miss on the whole um, as, a, as a broad market, then you know, we could see a big retreat from the 6,300 level. Not saying that's the base case, but it is a possibility. So I've taken a little bit of risk off the table. I've had the good fortune of being able to lock in some profits of late. And there's now only three positions I hold, and I specifically hold them heading into reporting season because I expect those companies to do well. Um, so BSL is one um, on the back of you know, supportive uh, steel prices in the US. Uh, Qantas is another one. I've spoken about that at length before. Um, and the other one is Borrell, um, you know, which had a big sell down in the past couple of months on an update to the market about its headwaters acquisition that wasn't received so well, but as a transitory factor, and I think they can overcome it when they report. So, yeah, taken, we have taken, so I've taken some risk off the table, um, and now I'm only holding purely stocks that I think uh, will beat expectations. Okay. Um Look, Chris, I'm sorry to just um, take a pause there for a moment, but we are just getting some news here from the Bank of Japan policy meeting, and I know that a lot of market watchers have been looking out for this one in particular, um, just to see how markets around the Asian region track as well. So I might just go through some of these um, breakers, and if this is something that you are watching, maybe you can, you can comment, but otherwise we'll move on. But look, the BOJ maintaining its long-term yield target around 0%. It makes its policy framework more flexible, and I think that is really what what we were looking at perhaps here um, are making it more sustainable as well, looking for any tweaks to this massive stimulus program to make it more sustainable. Um, now, it's changed its pledge on its long-term yield target. It's adopted forward guidance on its policy rates. It will maintain a very low rate levels for an extended period of time. Uh, the long-term rates may move upwards and downwards to some extent, depending on economic and, and price development. The BOJ will conduct a JGB buying in a flexible manner, so outstanding amount will increase at an annual pace of around 80 trillion yen. Um, we know that there's been some fairly big moves in the, in the JGB at 10-year yields, um, which seems like the market is, has been sort of gradually pricing in the possibility of these policy changes. Um, this week it will conduct, as I said, it will maintain those very low rate levels, taking into account economic price uncertainties, including net next year's sales tax hike um, and look just you know there's a lot of commentary here to, to get through um, but just basically saying they've decided to adopt the forward guidance for policy rates to enhance sustainability of its, uh, of, of its policy framework um, their forward guidance is aimed at conducting uh, market operations and asset buying in a more flexible manner um, so there, uh, there's, there were a couple of members that actually were opposed to the decision on the yield curve control um, um, but overall, just looking here, the BOJ's decision on the yield curve control made by a 7 to 2 vote. Um, and ju just watching the movement here of markets, um, the Japanese Nikkei, the Nikkei 225, has turned positive after the BOJ's policy decision, up about 0.2% on last check. The dollar yen has risen 0.2% after the, the decision here, and the benchmark 10-year JGB futures have paired some of those losses um, after the BOJ's policy decision. Um, so Chris, I know that this is all just breaking, you know, sort of listening to, to a lot of this. Is there anything that you can pull out that you can perhaps take us through, particularly given those moves? Because I know we were watching the yen just edging up against the US dollar. Um, it looks like that dollar yen, though, um, looks like there may have been just a bit of weakness in the yen. The dollar yen rising 0.2 of a percent after the, uh, the policy decision. Did, did you want to make any comment there as to what you've just heard on the BOJ? Yeah, sure. Look, what I'll say, Leanne, is in uh, just in context of you know what some of the other people on the show this morning had been talking about, and some of the expectations and some of the reactions that might have been expected. It seems as though this is fairly muted, and it seems as though the Bank of Japan hasn't done all that much, but give itself some more flexibility so it can manoeuvre in different ways further down the line if necessary. So. Yeah, like I said, from the expectations that were laid out this morning of some of the more extreme possibilities, it seems like the BOJ didn't get anywhere near that, and that's reflected in, um, as I said, fairly muted moves for both the Nikkei and the dollar yen. It'd be interesting to see how it continues to unfold, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think probably on the lower end of the spectrum of uh, the violent shifts some were anticipating.
Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. We'll continue to closely watch just to see how the market reacts and, of course, the, the dollar-yen as well. Um, maybe we can just move on, though, and we can talk some more um, individual corporate news. I know that we've been talking a lot about your broader expectations for reporting season. Um, Origin Energy, I know it was one that was out today, um, out with some of those numbers, at record production and revenues in, in the June quarter, obviously a big production boost there. Um, higher oil prices, no doubt, has, has played into um, some pretty significant achievements you'd have to say for Origin. What did you make of the update today from the company? We certainly liked it, Leanne. A 4% increase in production to record levels uh, and obviously uh, uh, subsequent increase in revenues and of course benefiting, as you say, from stronger oil prices as well. So we actually uh, recommended this stock in our long-term portfolio back in February and one of the things that we pointed to was uh, the full year benefit of having a, the second production train online at the uh, APLNG project um, and it was something that their CEO pointed to in the results today is having that full year benefit of that second production train because of course it lowers the unit cost of production um, and that's of course an exponential, an exponential relationship um, which they've managed to get the benefit of. So really the dual benefit of more production at a lower price at a time when oil prices, as we all know, have uh, have been on the up. So, yeah, continue to like Origin. Um, and I think, you know, th these numbers from Origin today are a reflection of what we're likely to see more broadly and what I was talking about earlier about the performance of materials and energy plays is, you know, they have all done extremely well in cutting costs at a time when uh, commodity prices have been on the rise. So. Um, margin expansion is the key story there. Yeah, sure. Um, and look, just finally, um, and I suppose this sort of takes us back to the beginning of the conversation, more broadly with what's happening in the tech space. We know that there was, a, again, a bit of a sell-off in those US tech stocks um, through the overnight session. Um, you know, wondering the implications, and yes, we're seeing some weakness for some of those tech plays like Wise Tech and, and Altium. You can put zero maybe even into that category as well. Do you think there is further to go with the, the tech um, weakness that we are seeing on Wall Street, and what sort of implications, if any, does it have for us here? Yes, yeah, certainly there very well could be, and if, if nothing else, uh, not from a valuation perspective, but purely from a sentiment perspective, you know, you're seeing hot money flow out of the likes of Facebook and Amazon and Apple and various other tech companies in America and, mm. and move back into more defensive stocks, and I think that's the story that we'll see here in Australia as well, and it coincides very nicely with the fact, as I was saying before, that I think investors this time around are circumspect on holding those stocks that have had the 100, 150, 200% increases over the last 12 months into results that are, you know, potentially a big no unknown or clearly are a big unknown, unless you have inside information and could see, you know, a, a massive sell off in the share price. So, yeah, I think it's that rotation of hot money moving away from tech, uh, of course, both in America and here in Australia into some more defensive plays ahead of a reporting season where people are reluctant to be holding or carrying that much risk, I guess you'd say. All right, excellent. Look, Chris Conway from the Australian Stock Report. It's always a pleasure. We do appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leanne. Cheers. That was uh, Chris Conway joining us there and just watching